I'm going to break this into a few pieces. I'm going to talk a little bit about, as I said, my journey and where I started along the way. Um, and then I'm going to hopefully convince maybe 80% of you to never ever get into business or be an entrepreneur, period. And then hopefully I'll inspire maybe 20% of you to jump in or keep doing what you're doing. Uh, so there's going to be some, you know, the, as they said, the good, the bad, and the ugly in this. Um, I do want to acknowledge um, my parents are here, Maureen and Dave LG, and my children, Lily and Brendan LG, um, who have all lived through all of this, of course, with me uh, for a very long time. So I certainly appreciate them being um, in the room. And uh, of course, these are the early years with my brother and I and my parents, <laughs> and uh, kind of the early beginning. So both of my parents um, are entrepreneurs. They've been involved in um, real estate and property management, but many other businesses along the way in my life from running fudge companies to helicopter tours uh, to video rental companies, you name it. So I was born and raised in an entrepreneurial environment and that's really um, what I always knew. Um, I was also a bit of a nerd, admittedly. Uh, that's me there. And uh, I did go to band camp multiple years in a row. I played a lot of instruments and uh, yeah, I was in band camp. So when I was young, because my parents were in business, uh, dad took a really early interest in technology. And so I, I always felt, and to this day, very privileged to have been brought up in an environment where, you know, I think in, in his university courses, this, this is punch card time, right, with, with computers. But, you know, he was a real early adopter of, of computers and was right into it. And so um, I was always exposed to that at home from very, very young age. And so while all my friends were playing with Commodore 64s, for those of you who remember what that even means with like cool graphics and cool video games. This is what I was brought up on. And this is a TRS-80 Model 1 uh, that bought at Radio Shack. That cassette player on the side is actually not for music, but that's where we stored our data at the time when we were writing programs. These things did not play games at all. Um, but this is where I started to learn about computers and tech at a, at a very early age. In fact, um, one of my best, you know, presents ever, I thought, in those days, was this thing. Does anyone know what this thing is? Can anyone put up their hands? Well, one. That's it. So everyone knows what a modem is, because in the early days of internet, we used modems. But before the internet even existed, um, you could still go online, and you could do things like get on bulletin boards or whatnot. And so this is what's called um, an acoustic coupler. And this was a 300 baud modem. And so you would take your landline phone, you would put it over those uh, couplings, and you would, you would dial a phone number, you would get a handshake signal at the other end. Everyone remembers that modem handshake noise, right? And then you would be connected to, to online. But online wasn't anything like it is today. It was like you could do some very basic things, look up some information, and eventually you could start to send messages with it. So, for a fun fact, I, I decided to look up um, how long it would take to download like a two hour 4K movie. So on Netflix today, if it's kind of compressed, it's about five gig of data. And you want to take a shot at how long it would have taken to download a two hour 4K movie with that thing? Any guesses? Just throw one out there. Two weeks? Four and a half years. <laughs> That's how long it would have taken my children to wait to watch their six movies a day. You'd probably be waiting like 20, what, 27 years at that point, right? To watch six movies in one day. Uh, so that was it. Uh, I went to uh, Sir James Dunn, where as I mentioned, I was in the band. I think I was 12 years old. I was also involved in the computer club. And in those days, like no one was into computers. They were definitely not cool. And all the people in the club were like, way older than me. So my parents, you know, of course knew I was a nerd and so they've got like me hosting computer club events, feeding these guys snacks and that's what we did, you know. <laughs> so after that, um, I went uh, to University at Western um, and, and I was always, of course, keenly interested in business. And so some things I learned along the way in school is that Taking foundational courses in even as early as grade 12 in high school, um, things like accounting, finance, tax, 
general business understanding will provide you with a foundation for not only your business life, but your personal life as well forever. This is where you learn about you know, interest and you learn about mortgages and you learn about compound interest and taxes and things like that that will serve you forever well. And it's a shame um, that it's not a bigger part of the school system today because we graduate kids not knowing any idea and Northern, of course, knows all about this, which is why they run financial literacy programs, etc. I also learned that university, for me, was boring as hell. Uh, I went there 15 hours a class a week. It was really boring. Um, collected records then, kind of dating myself a little bit, but that's, that's kind of what I did. Um, and what I learned that I missed out on university, but I was very keen on in high school, was that being involved in your community, whatever that may be, whether it's the city or in this case, you know, the band camp, the computer club, the yearbook committee, which I was also on, um, was really important because that stimulated me to, um, you know, learn and excel and be, um, you know, be a lot more than just my bored self and my, my university life. Um, after I got out of university, I worked in financial services in a sales and marketing role for I think about a year and a half or so. Um, and then I actually came to reopen a business that I first started when I was thinking about grade 12. So because of my computer background in high school, I, um, I, I would work with some small businesses. I actually worked for a microwave in town at the time, you know, helping people set up computers. And so uh, mom still has this mug, of course. She <laughs> gave me the picture the other day. <laughs> uh, I opened the first company, which was Next Generation Consulting, unofficially in grade 12, and then formally in 1997. And Next Generation Consulting was a, a computer consulting company. We literally helped uh, some people at their homes, but also some small businesses set up networks, you know, set up their computers, install windows, all those kinds of things. Um, I hated it. I grew to hate it, actually, because I found that in time, uh, people are never really happy with their computers. There's all, you know, they're calling you because there's a problem. They expect them to work, and they just don't always work, especially in those days. And so people were always grumpy, and you realize that you could never really make your clients ecstatic. You could never really go above and beyond. At best, you could just kind of satisfy them, and that was that. And so in time, it became really a dream. Um, but I did learn a lot along the way, and of course, I made many tremendous connections in the, in the community from a business standpoint. What I learned there was that um, as an independent kind of sole proprietor, that's one thing, but as soon as you hire employee number one, it's a whole different world. And in those days, you know, I'd got to the point where I was a little bit too busy myself to take on all the work. I wanted to grow the business, um, but then I hired someone and things got a bit slow. So about half of our time, we actually set up network computers and used to play multiplayer games against each other uh, during the day while we waited for the phone to ring and for business to come in. Uh, and so, <laughs> you know, in time, you realize, well, that really doesn't last long because you need to bring the business in yourself to be able to pay your employees. And so you learn a whole different level of responsibility. I also learned in those early, early days that I liked business and I liked tech and I liked dealing with clients, but I was really, really bad at things like bookkeeping and banking. And I mean, I knew how to do it, I just hated to do it. It wasn't, wasn't my interest and I had all these other things to keep me busy. And so I learned um, now that having good people like bookkeepers and accountants and lawyers um, around you from the very beginning is extremely important. Uh, find the right professionals that you can work with and set up your business right from the first time. Because at about year three, it took about two years to catch up on the disaster that I left behind myself as I was out building this business and really not taking care of those things in the proper way. I learned early on from um, uh, my dad, I'll always remember conversations about, you know, I'm pretty young at this point, and I thought, you know, what's my hourly rate gonna be? And I really learned to not undersell yourself, and that'll come up a couple times tonight. Um, but I learned that if you price your services or your products too low, then people won't value them. You know, do a good job and charge a fair value for what it was. It doesn't, doesn't matter if you're 20 years old or 50 years old. Uh, charge a fair value, and as long as you do good work, then, then people will, will pay it. And they did pay it. I also learned that clients don't really care about you. And this is an important lesson along the way. I'll never forget the moment in time 
I used to take my cell phone was the published number for the business. And so every call came in. I only had two employees at this point in time. But every call came in. And of course, if a business had a problem with their network or their computers, they didn't care if it was at night or if it was a weekend. They just wanted it fixed. And I was at a Thanksgiving dinner at my grandparents' place. And of course, a call comes in from a client. I leave the room. I still do this, by the way, so I haven't completely learned. <laughs> I leave the room and I, I go and um, get on an hour call for this emergency client. It came back and my grandma said to me, you know what? She said, if you were gone tomorrow, they wouldn't care about you. They'd go on to the next person. They'd find someone else to fix their computers for you. And it always really stuck with me. Not that you should not have great relationships with your clients, but that you shouldn't build your business up on the belief that um, you know, clients really care about you as an individual, and you should take care of yourself um, while doing your best to service clients. At the same time, what I also learned was that in small communities, um, and this served us very well as we grew the business beyond Sault Ste. Marie, that doing what you'll say you do, you'll do is probably one of the most important things you can do. Um, at the end of the day, your business reputation in terms of delivery uh, is critical. And in a small market, if you don't deliver on your promises, um, everyone knows it. And so later on, as we get into the story of Lucidia, we learned that as we entered larger markets like Toronto and started dealing with big clients, we, were, we would work our asses off to make sure that we delivered things on specification and on time. And because they were coming from markets in Toronto where there was hundreds of ad agencies, which we became at that point in time, um, we realized that that was a real differentiator from us. That kind of small town integrity, you know, discipline to deliver on what we say um, really became critical over the years. So while this little three-person computer consulting company is rolling along, um, I was working with another partner business called Internet Media. Internet Media was in the early days of the web, developing websites and uh, they were selling internet services, things like that. And we had a great relationship. I actually tried to get into that business, realized I knew nothing about it and gave up and started referring it all to them. And they were referring me the IT work that we were interested in. And one day I got a call from the two partners and they said, uh, I'll never forget where we were sitting at the water tower at lunch. And they said, Jeff, we're not going to make our payroll tomorrow. Got 10 staff and we can't make payroll. And we know that you have a lot of common clients and we know you're interested in the business and what can you do? They said, well, I can't do anything because you have bigger issues than I can resolve for you. Um, but I am interested in the business and so maybe I can help and take some of your staff over and pick up some of the work that you've got, some prepaid obligations, we'll fulfill them. Um, and that was that. The next morning, I had, I went from three staff in a little attic office um, above mom and dad's office on Queen Street, coincidentally right across the street from where we are today now, uh, to all of a sudden having now eight staff and no place for them. And so the first couple of days were um, throwing them in the back of my uh, Dodge Intrepid <laughs> car at the time and uh, driving them up to Staples and saying, look, I'm busy. You guys got to pick out furniture because you need a place to sit and we got to find office space right away. And so we did that within the first couple of days. And then we went out to Dell and ordered some computers up. And they said, look, I got to go do work for clients on the consulting side. Uh, why don't you guys come up with a name for this business that we're starting that I don't really know anything about? And uh, so that was the beginning of Lucidia. The staff of five sat around on the floor with no computers and just sketchbooks and started coming up with ideas for names and, and they came up with Lucidia. So Lucidia uh, started as this five person digital agency and over the years up until um, I sold it to, to partners in the business, um, it became about a 30 person, it kind of floated around that 20 to 30 person range um, integrated marketing communications agency uh, that did work all over Northern Ontario and actually well beyond that as well. Um, so now we weren't just building websites, we were doing full service marketing, communication services. Um, and that really was the first kind of big, big business that I got involved in. So of course you learned some things along the way doing that as well. One is that the idea of going from five people is very different um, from managing 15 people and then very different 
managing 30 people again. What we learned along the way, and we never really figured it out, was that as you grow into that 30 person range, you start to add on layers of middle management, project management, things that distance you from the things that maybe you love, which would be in the weeds implementation, coupled with building great client relationships. And all of a sudden now there's people in the midst of that, which means that it's not just all about great relationships and quick delivery, it's about process and having people around that can handle that. And we've learned that's a really different, different kind of animal altogether. And we kept banging our heads against this kind of 30 person range and we'd have to pull back because we would start losing money because we'd have too many expenses and we weren't picking up sales fast enough. And so we really did that a lot along the way. We also learned as we opened offices in Thunder Bay and Toronto, um, that it's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, that the human side, the people management side of it can be extremely complicated. And in, in the case of Thunder Bay, that, that office eventually failed as we decided to then move our focus into Toronto. I also learned in the early days that great people are what make your business great. And, you know, we had incredible staff, um, people, my brother was one of them who started months after the agency and worked in it um, until the very end of when I sold it. And he still now works with me on many other projects. Um, but we had some awesome people along the way. In fact, I have some uh, former staff, Jason Collins, and I've got a business partner, Kevin Russell, and uh, uh, I don't know what we call you, Matt, but you're like a staff. You're a contractor, but you're staff, Matt Lajoie, in the audience. And you learn that um, having amazing people is night and day difference um, in running these businesses. And sometimes, even still today, uh, you have to take that risk on investing in and bringing in great people who are hopefully smarter than you. And you got to get over that. We learned that too. You know, there's a, you learn what you're bad at. For me, that's a lot of things. And you learn to appreciate people that can complement the weaknesses you have and let them do their job and respect that they're going to do it better than you ever will. I also learned though, and this isn't a universal truth by any means, but staff also don't really care about you. Meaning, you can overinvest yourself in staff, and I have done this many times in the past. Um, but at the end of the day, the day that you decide you might not write them a paycheck, they're not really your friends anymore. So be careful a little, you know, what you think about your relationship with staff. I'm a big believer that people should be treated extremely fairly. They are your business, so you need to nurture them um, and make sure that they're happy. Um, but just remember, uh, you have a personal life outside of that and uh, they don't really care <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, we also learned in these days that we could do anything the Toronto firms could do. And we had an early account manager that we took a risk on, which was bringing someone in from a big Toronto digital agency, Teresa Martoon, who's now the uh, executive director of the Hospital Foundation in the Sioux here. Um, but she had these big client relationships. She came back to the Sioux because this was home for her and we were kind of in her field. And she had a relationship with Fairmont Hotels and Resorts worldwide. And, you know, the client really liked her, which speaks to having great quality client relationships. And she thought, well, maybe we could pitch on a little bit of work for them. And so I'll never forget the day Teresa and Tony, who was our, our creative director, uh, and I go into the you know boardrooms of the Fairmont Global Corporation at the Royal York in Toronto, so scared, so scared about pitching a client like this. And um, you know we went in and we were real. We said we'll deliver it for this price on this time. They liked Teresa. They trusted her. Uh, they took a shot on us. We delivered that project. And to this day. Fairmont Worldwide, which has actually now been acquired by another company, um, was a major client of Lucidius. Uh, we did massive amounts of work for them over almost a 15 year period of time. And because of that confidence that we built there, we started to seek out other Toronto clients. We did work for the Canadian PGA, we did work for Ontario Lottery, we did work for Ontario Tourism. We did work for uh, credit unions like Northern Credit Union, right up to some of the largest credit unions in the country. Um, and so we weren't afraid anymore because we knew that we had a team of people that was just as good as anyone you'd find in Toronto. Um, but we also had that small town mentality and that integrity to deliver on what we said when we said we would do it. 
And so for those of you in the room, I'll keep saying it through this presentation, but you're as good as the big firms and the staff in Toronto, and I would encourage you to get out there. We had some little fun things along the way. Um, in the early days of the agency, we decided to also start brokering domain names, and so we ended up buying Mackinac.com and building a tourist destination around that, which is still a business that, I'm, that I own today. Um, you know, what I learned there was think outside the box. Mackinac was a client. Uh, the people that owned it were private people who didn't really have any money to spend. And so we said, well, we can't do work for you for nothing, so why don't we just buy the site from you and we'll do it ourselves. And that's how Mackinac kind of came about. Um, once again, don't be afraid to get out of town. And once again, don't undersell yourself. We went in and took over that business and raised the rates by about 2,000% for the clients that had been involved with it the years before, but we gave them a much better product and service, and they all jumped on board. Um, after selling the agency, about six months after I started a company called Dick, um, which is the Digital Intelligence Group, this is still an active company that Kevin Russell is now the majority owner of, but I'm still involved as a shareholder. Um, and it is a digital consulting company uh, working with clients all over the country. Kevin is like a, well, well not a world traveler, domestic traveler now. <laughs> Flying all over Western Canada, throws a little bit of skiing in here and there. Uh, but doing a lot of work and helping clients kind of optimize their online presence, search social um, campaigns and things like that. Um, I think what I learned here was bring great staff closer. Uh, you know, Kevin is an entrepreneur himself, uh, very much. He'll be up here doing a talk probably next year. Uh, good tip, man. Um, and, uh, you know, as Kevin became a shareholder of the business, you learned that, you know, trusting him and, and bringing him closer into it uh, was key. I don't think, because I got busy with Village Media, which you'll hear about in a minute, I don't think that Dig would exist today if Kevin hadn't come on board and hadn't have invested himself as a partner and shareholder in that business as well. We also learned to specialize. Uh, at the agency, we try to be many things to many people. And Dig was about, hey, what are the things that we like to do and what are the things that we're great at um, versus you know, just things that we think we can make money on and that's that. Um, so we did that. Um, we also kept getting out of town. I keep talking about this, but it's key to all of these businesses in that you know, the Sioux is a great place to live, raise a family, uh, great place to run a business, but, but you'll always hit a cap in this market. And so we learned quickly um, that you've got to also look out of, out of town. And I also learned to fire clients. This is also a great learning along the way. Um, and I remember the first time I did it, it was a Lucidia client. And you know, some clients you just can't please. It doesn't matter what you do. Or maybe just it's a personality conflict or maybe you did a bad job for them, I don't know. Um, but I remember when I fired my first client, and it wasn't rude, it wasn't like, you know, yelling at them, it was just like, you know, I'm really sorry, I just don't think this is a good relationship for us to be in, and you know, let's help you find someone else to do your work. Well, the business took off after that, because what you learn about bad clients is that they bring you down, they bring your staff down, they suck the life out of you, and they generally hate paying. Um, so fire your clients, do it. If, if for those of you that run businesses here today, uh, I want you to all think of that one client that keeps you up at night, it's never happy, and go tomorrow and fire them. Be polite, don't, never be rude, don't burn bridges. Just find a super nice way to say, hey, you know what, I don't think this is working out for both of us. Now, I had some stories along the way, you'll think, oh, look at all these successes you've had. Well, there was many non-successes, or things that were kind of successful, but then petered out. For a while, I thought it would be cool to own a travel agency because we really liked the tourism business. I knew nothing about the travel agency business, started that out. Uh, Jason, who was an entrepreneur himself, who actually worked with us for a bit, uh, he and I, uh, well, he was the lead, but we worked on a, a technology platform for churches and the diocese, and um, it was a really cool concept, but that, you know, kind of went, went away. And, uh, one point uh, uh, with a partner in Lucidia at the time, he was a real kind of, uh, really, he was an accountant. <laughs> and uh, he thought it would be good that we would buy a bookkeeping company, so we did that and ran that for a while. That didn't work out so well. And as I got into the years of Village Media, I thought maybe it'd be really fun to run like a bunch of internet radio stations. 
and uh, that was called VM Radio. And that was a great concept, but that all didn't work out either. So I don't want to sit up here telling you that you know everything we've done has worked. <laughs> worked out well. There's been lots of mistakes along the way, which you, you of course always learn from. So that takes me to uh, today and to Village Media, uh, which formally the, the, the corporation Village Media was established in 2013. Uh, it actually dates way back to about the year 2000 as a company called SueCoupons.com um, that, that um, a man by the name of Dick Peppolo had conceptualized. And he had come to my dad uh, and another group of investors in town with this idea to build a site to sell coupons to local retailers um, online. And so this was kind of happening around the time that I was running the IT company, but then starting to um, get into the web business. Uh, but I really wasn't, you know, we didn't know a lot about this. And this was something that was kind of a little bit connected to it, but not, not aggressively. Well, the coupon business, um, like all businesses, when you start them out, wasn't quite what you, you think it's going to be. And so that business over a couple of years actually morphed into what, of course, now is known as Sue Today. Everyone heard of Sue Today here? Anyone not heard of Sue Today here? I think we've all heard of Sue Today. Um, and that uh, group of investors in that group then launched a sister site in North Bay called Bay Today in 2003. And those sites um, did something that uh, to this day uh, has only been replicated in one other place in Canada, um, and that's a, a company out west. And that was they built a massive, massive digital audience for local media. Sue Today is still regarded as a pioneer in the early days of digital local publishing. Um, and is still one of the largest sites by capita, uh, per capita in the entire country and probably through most of the U.S. as far as I can see it. When I found the company out west and, and called them up to hear about their numbers, it was like finding life on another planet. It's like this, this, we didn't think this was possible, but here's another person out there like it. So those companies ran, um, while I was running Lucidia, uh, we had a, a a minority shareholder interest in them. Uh, we did some work for uh, Sue Today and Bay Today. We did some, the, the development work. We did some creative work for them. You know, we were, we were uh, involved on the, kind of on the sidelines a bit. Um, and then in 2013, after the agency sold and Dick was started, um, I started doing some consulting for Sue Today um, and really found uh, myself fascinated with the business and the potential for it. And so approached the, the shareholders and, and um, you know, we did some restructuring work and, and I took over as the CEO in, in 2013. Now, I will say that when I started DIG, I kind of had this vision in my life that I would probably work really hard three days a week consulting for clients, kind of chill out a little bit on the other couple of days a week and just settle down after 15 years of, you know, driving myself <laughs> did that working. And, uh, you know, that lasted six months um, to the point where I, where I took over Sue today and then I got right back into it again. Um, but then the story really began and, and Village Media is uh, a tremendously exciting company. It's been um, quite the ride. You know, we kind of started slow into this business, figuring it out, uh, making sure we had the right people on board. We amalgamated Bay Today. We took over our local competitor, uh, Local 2 in the suit. We integrated their teams. The next year, we launched Timmins only because a guy in Timmins owned the site and it was a hobby site for him. And he approached us and we thought, well, we should probably do this even though we're not ready for it, which we weren't. Um, we also um, went to Sudbury where we had Northern Life, which is a community newspaper. And uh, I had got to know the owner of that through other businesses through the years. And we said, look, you know, this is what we're doing and we really want to grow this business across the north and as a courtesy we just want to let you know that we're probably going to come and compete with you. And they came to the Sioux the next day I think and said, you know, learned about what we were doing and said, well, we don't want to compete with you, we want to part with, partner with you. And so they actually became the first partner media company that we brought on board of the network. In 2015, uh, we launched Barry, we partnered with a Thunder Bay company called Dougal Media we partnered with Manitoulin Exposure. So at this point, uh, we had pretty strong reach across Northern Ontario, uh, but we were left with this really shitty 15-year-old technology platform that we, in fact, had kind of built ourselves along the way, 
but it had become Frankenstein, right? I mean, for those of you that remember Sue today in the days, you, you kind of know what it looked like. Well, it functioned, um, and it obviously drove a massive audience, but we knew we had work to do. So we were kind of doing that um, in behind the scenes. My brother is, in fact, the lead and basically the sole developer of what is now regarded as one of the best and most, uh, the best and fastest publishing platforms in the world. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that in a while. So we launched you today on that in January 2016. We launched Guelph in February. We launched Sudbury on a new site in April, uh, a site in Halifax in May, a site in Thunder Bay in September, another regional business site that September. Um, and in 2017, after we launched Guelph, I'll talk about, about that in a minute, um, all of a sudden Google starts talking about us. And not just Google Canada, but I remember seeing, just coincidentally, I came across an article, um, I think it was in the National Post, where a man named Richard Gingras, who's the Vice President of News for Google Worldwide, starts talking about you know, Village Media and our newsroom of the future. And it was kind of crazy because I'd never even talked to Richard or Google before. I had no idea that they even knew about us. And uh, so we'll talk about what happened with that in a minute. Um, but we carried on. We launched Elliott Lake, um, and then we created our first partnership agreement with Rogers Media, uh, which is the big Rogers you know, company that you would all know, We're launching Halifax. And in 2018, we got rolling again. We launched Aurelia in January, um, and I'm going to play a little clip on that in a minute. Um, after they lost their daily newspaper that had been around for uh, well over 100 years. We launched Collingwood in February, Ottawa in March with Rogers. Then we partnered with another media company out west called Glacier Media. We launched Kamloops. We launched Bradford on our own in April. Kitchener with Rogers in June. Prince George with Glacier in September. Newmarket on our own in September as well. This January we launched Thorold. In February we launched Moose Jaw with Glacier Media. And just this month, we've brought on board a new partner in Great West Newspapers and launched St. Albert today. So it's been a little bit quiet. <laughs> today, uh, Village Media is now a, 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 an ever-expanding network of local news sites across Canada. Um, we are regarded as a pioneer in digital media. We now have 21 sites uh, across the country, 11 of which we own and operate, and 10 with partners. We work with some of the largest media companies in, in the country, Glacier Media, the Canadian Press, Rogers Media, and now just recently, um, Great West Newspapers. Uh, we are on the board of the Canadian Journalism Foundation, on the board of the National News Media Council, and a member of News Media Canada, which we've had to fight for all along the way uh, against the big newspaper companies to get our position in the publishing industry as a digital-only publisher. I'll always remember, um, you know, along the way through the businesses, you, you know, you naturally you're doing business in small community, you win awards, and so there's a whole bunch of awards that, that, that have been won along the way. Uh, but I've never been much of one to hang my diploma on the wall or awards or any of that, so they sit in a box somewhere in a basement. Um, but I'll always remember the day that I thought, you know what, we did it, we, we arrived. And it was the first day that we were on the front page of Report on Business with the Globe and Mail. Um, and that is the only thing that sits framed in my office. It's just that one article, which I thought was the greatest thing ever, because I've always thought the Globe and Mail was a great publication. Uh, the Globe and Mail wrote about us because of our work in Guelph. Um, the Guelph Mercury, which was the oldest standing daily newspaper in Canada, shut down, and we opened a site eight days later uh, with some of their staff effectively replacing uh, the, 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 the content that they were producing inside the community. And so I'll always remember that moment. But it was also, um, you know, kind of accelerated by shortly after, you know, me looking at the fact, hey, the vice president of news of Google in California is talking about us in the press. Maybe I should just try to write this guy. Like, he'll probably never write me back, right? But maybe you should just write him and say, hey, you know, thanks for talking about us. I really appreciate it. By the way, it'd be nice if we actually talked sometime. And... Um, Richard ended up writing me back almost immediately. Uh, we got on a video conference, and now everywhere I go to speak at conferences about Village Media, people from all over the world know me and Village Media because Richard talks about us everywhere. We get calls from Europe, we get calls from Australia. Everyone says, oh, you're the guys Google always talk about. And so they really have um, you know, been a tremendous partner of ours, but have really kind of... Uh, 
latched onto us as a success story of, of local media. Along the way, there was an, there's another business that we started too, which is Village Electric, which is also a video production company. Um, and, and that, of course, continues to run along as well. So there's a few businesses uh, going on. So that's the journey. And uh, I know we don't have a ton of time, so I'm gonna try to breeze through what I call the animal portion of my presentation. You'll see a total slide format change. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you about why you don't wanna do this first. And this is where, as I said, I hopefully scare 80% of you away or like you're gonna quit your small business tomorrow because you're gonna say, shit, he's right, this is terrible. Uh, I shouldn't do this. Um, and 20% of you hopefully towards the end will be supercharged about either jumping into the do this or, or doing it even more. There's some varying stats that you can get on this, but almost all small businesses will, will not survive their first year. Um, it is 85% is the stat that I've seen. I've heard upwards of that, and Evan might have better data. But basically, you're most likely going to fail at any new small business startup that you get involved in. You are going to work your ass off. You are going to probably work on average 90 hours a week to build up a new business from the beginning and that might last for a really long time. You will never know everything. Uh, you will continue to make mistakes um, and you are in a constant state of learning. This is not gonna be a job that you just kind of figure out and do for the rest of the, your life. You are gonna be in a constant state of needing to advance, uh, improve yourself, improve the business. It never ends. Um, you're gonna learn that it's lonely at the top for reasons I talked about earlier, you know? You can have great staff, you can have great clients, but um, it isn't all about great personal relationships. Sometimes you have to make tough decisions and sometimes you're very alone when you do that. I, my favorite thing when people come up to me is like, oh, it must be great to be your own boss. Like, no, fuck off, it's not great to be your own boss. Like, I got 100 bosses, I've got all my staff are my bosses because they tell me what to do and they bug me all day long and all my clients are actually my real bosses because I work for all of them. So I'm not my own boss. I got way more bosses than anyone does in, in the company. You will have sleepless nights. Last night was a good one for me, not because of this. I don't get too worried about this stuff anymore, but because I got a lot of stuff going on in the business, so I slept about three hours last night, which really sucks. Um, and you're gonna have a lot of those and I still keep having those. And there's a real, there's really something to be said about the psychological cost of entrepreneurship. And there's actually a great new study that's come out about that. And it talks about much higher incidences of anxiety, depression, mania, you name it, in entrepreneurs in particular compared to anyone generally that might be working in the business. And uh, you will experience this. And because of that, because of that stress and that pressure and that workload, um, there are times where you lose sight of yourself. Um, there's no question along the way for me, there has been great personal sacrifice and cost uh, to me in, 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 you know, for a million reasons, but a lot of it stems from uh, work and stress that builds up and, and can ruin people over time. So, maybe you wanna leave now. You're done, you're out. <laughs> if anyone wants to leave the presentation because they're out of this whole, concept of starting a small business, I totally understand. So if you're gonna stick in, then a bit of advice. Um, you know, give it a try. Uh, it kind of goes with the next one. Don't let people tell you you're crazy. Along the way, many people, uh, including amazing trusted mentors, have told me I'm nuts for doing things. Uh, and probably a lot of the times that have been right. <laughs> um, but a lot of times they haven't been right. And so I really believe that as an entrepreneur, um, if you really believe in something and have passion, uh, then probably in time you'll make it work uh, if you're ready to put in the effort. And so uh, to me, if you think something seems a bit off the wall but you feel like it's the right thing, then give it a shot. I mean, what's the worst thing that's gonna happen? You're gonna go bankrupt, you're gonna lose everything that you've ever worked for. <laughs> you can always start something up new the next day. It's no problem. <laughs> Um, build a network. Um, I, I've learned a, a, an important part of me getting out of town and traveling more and being involved more in the industry uh, is that it's so incredible to connect with like-minded people, uh, whether it's just other entrepreneurs or people that are in the industry space that you're in. Um, sometimes that might be really difficult to, to find in Sault Ste. Marie. And so join associations, uh, go to events out of town, uh, you'll find that it will really kind of 
supercharge your thinking and your energy level. Um, and, and, and you know, as you said, the, the world all of a sudden becomes a very small place. I have met publishers from all over the world. Um, the latest, uh, one of the latest things that we implemented on the platform was uh, something I learned from a lady in the Philippines who runs a site called The Rappler, and I met her in California at a Google event. I mean, the world is so small. She's now famous worldwide because she's fighting with the government. They put her in jail. Uh, that's a whole different story. But uh, you, you really you find that building a network of people, um, and, and different than your friends, but, but this professional network is incredibly important. Um, over the years, all the businesses that we've been involved in have been um, heavily invested in the community. Um, you know, uh, I think community, which, which can be you know, your local city, it could be your province, it could be your country, it could be your industry, um, deserves your time, your money, and your passion. Um, I say passion because for those that know me, there are some times that I hate this city. Um, and it comes out of me passionately because it, it comes out of frustration for wanting change and things to be better. Um, but it's because it comes from a place of care. And uh, you'll see all of our businesses um, get very involved in, in the cities that we're in. Uh, think globally um, is, is also key. Outside of getting out of town to kind of the Torontos of the world, um, there's opportunity all over the, all over, um, the, the planet. Um, but you also have to watch out because uh, your job or your business could be wiped out by global competitors faster than you know it. Um, as I've said a number of times, um, bringing the right people onto the team is absolutely critical. To me, there's no business that's going to succeed without the right people involved. But you have to fire the wrong people, no matter how tough that is. And I've, I've you know, often reflected on this because it's a terrible thing to do. Um, there's nothing worse than firing someone. Um, but what you learn is that it's almost your obligation as an owner um, to do that because it's not just about you. They're actually generally ruining it for everyone else. And what you learn along the way is that when people really reflect, um, if things aren't working out, it's not because they're bad people or they're not bright. Uh, it might just be because it's not the right fit. And a lot of people, when you kind of say, hey, look, this isn't really working out, they come to respect that in time. And, and so I've learned that um, for all the fear of, of firing people, uh, 99 times out of 100, it, it actually turns out better for everyone, including your team. When I started the, the first business, I did everything. Like I tried to do the books, which was terrible. I answered the phone all the time. I fixed people's computers. Uh, you name it, I did it. Um, and, and part of that was really great because sometimes you got to get into the weeds and a lot of people, especially as businesses get bigger, refuse to do that. Um, so I think it's super important to do that. But eventually you can't do everything. And bringing people around you that are brighter than you um, and complement your weaknesses is critical. And at that point, it is time to delegate, trust them, and let go. And I did not learn that until a few years ago. And now you get great people in, and it's tremendously exciting what they can do. Uh, Kevin is a great example of that, uh, who's here today with me. Um, I have no idea where he is. Sometimes I'll call him. I don't know what city he's in. I don't know what, what he's doing. Um, but I know he's doing a great job. And I, I'm, I put this one in again because I still like this one. And this is my big takeaway for everyone. Like tomorrow, remember, you're going to do that. You're going to go and find one client to fire because then there's going to be five more right after that one because you're going to love it. You're going to feel so good. Uh, we've always been super competitive. Um, I think there's something healthy and sometimes something unhealthy about that, to be fair. Um, but we always want to crush our competitors. Right now, we want to crush Post Media and Torstar, the two biggest newspaper companies in the, can in the country. And it kind of motivates me. It's kind of sick. But, you know, along the way, <laughs> we've always learned that you got you know, you to look at what your competitors are doing. You got to think about how you can get better than, better than them and, and, and overachieve them. Uh, so sometimes a bit of competitive spirit is healthy. Um, and then the, the, the reminder to get out of town. Um, you are all uh, capable of doing things that anyone in Toronto or New York or you name it can do as long as you believe in yourself to do it. You'll figure it out. 
Uh, this is really hard to do because a little while ago I told you you're all going to burn out. You're going to work 90 hours a week. Um, I'm better at this now, not all the time, but uh, this concept of just resting and relaxing and chill out is key. Uh, recovery is uh, really important because once you get to the point of burnout, it's extremely difficult to recover from that. Um, and don't forget to have fun. We have had some fun along the way. I was going to put a couple slides of Tony Dunham in here, you know, Kevin. I got a lot of slides, pictures of people that actually they can't make the slideshow. But we have had a lot of fun along the way, and I think you know you can't forget to do that. Um, and you got to you got to celebrate your wins. So the outcome of all of that, you know, if you if you get through all of this, is that there are some incredibly positive things about being an entrepreneur and running a business. Uh, to me, you can find purpose in your life. Um, you know, work makes up a massive point of a massive part of our our, our waking lives, and doing something uh, that you believe in, that you feel energized about, that can make a difference, um, where you can be a leader. Um, to me. Uh, Finding that sense of purpose in yourself is, is, is really uh, important. Um, you can affect change like almost no one else in communities um, because you, you can provide services, you can provide staff time, you can eventually give organizations money, but you can help build a community around you as an entrepreneur. You can drive energy and passion in yourself by doing things that you love to do. And eventually you do get some sense of freedom. As much as you do have 100 bosses and you're going to work all the time, um, there's something very freeing uh, about being able to decide what's happening with the business tomorrow and where you're going. And all that ultimately results in potentially a legacy to leave for uh, the community, for future generations, uh, for others around you. So there can be some really great things about all of this. And uh, that's it. That's all. Thank you.